We all have those formative childhood experiences that stick with us, guiding us, shaping our lives. And one of mine is Mole Wrecked, the penultimate episode of the second season of Looney Tunes spin-off Tasmania from 1992. Cliché, I know. But I so distinctly remember the dread of those endless streetlights when the family's car breaks down in the mall's empty parking lot. Truly the raw essence of helplessness. Just begging for a 2016 Vaporwave remix. And I think about it often. Car parks, emptiness, the desolation of modernity. Recognizing these spaces that appear again and again on the periphery of lives and stories. You, you could say that multi-story. The great thing about car park jokes is they work on many levels. But bad puns aside, for now. That 1992 cartoon began the rubber band ball of noticing these spaces. Until I'm implored, nay, required, to ask the question, car parks, what do they mean? Do they mean things? Let's find out. Well, when it comes to cultural perception, the first thing we'll find is that they don't mean anything good. With experiences ranging from dude where's my car to voted most likely to be the last place you ever see. But more than the sight of personal misfortune, it's invoked as the ultimate symbol of apathetic destruction in Joni Mitchell's Big Yellow Taxi. Here, the car park becomes a demonstration of convenience over sustainability, our destructive willingness to take up space. One moment it's like, oh, were we in lot C or D? And next, bam! Climate crisis. Maybe I could be more specific here if my engagement with the end of the world went beyond recycling my little Diet Coke cans. But that's why the upbeat rhythm of Big Yellow Taxi makes it the anthem of the apocalypse. Far from being at odds with the somber lyrics as it's often positioned, it perfectly echoes the complacency with which we take things for granted. Strumming as Rome burns. Even the song itself, so familiar now, is maybe underappreciated fading into a kind of cultural ambience, just as the car park forms a kind of ambient architecture, an overlooked byproduct of modern life, quietly taking over. Destruction by proxy. The title of artist Guillaume Lachapelle's miniature diorama, Starry Night, hints at how these spaces have become as universal as the night sky, maybe even a replacement of it like a parasite replacing the tongue of its host. And while it retains some of its namesake's beauty too, the infinite mirroring of its lonely 3D printed scene suggests this beauty is one of convenience. Like the spectacular efficiency of a well-oiled machine, or when your lost lonely face is illuminated by the familiar glow of a Wendy's and you feel a bit better. There's comfort in its recognizable uniformity. We've accepted its place in our lives. Even the fish and the tongue-eating louse can live in some amount of lopsided harmony. But Terence Sharp writes of a more helpless condition in La Chapelle's exhibition text, noting the alienation of homogenous spaces. You built this, you live in it, so be subject to its throes. Which is what I'll say now whenever I can't find the car. Journalist Simon Parkin identifies a similar menace in the car park setting of Carl Burton's surreal puzzle game Islands Non Places, which is inevitably where we have to break out our emergency buzzword. Look, I'm, I'm allowed one per video, okay? That's the official allowance by Video Essay Law. Liminal space is characterized by the same thing that causes my reluctance to say it oversaturation. But more like when you say a word too many times and it loses meaning, liminal space is that with places. Places that are ubiquitous but anonymous and interchangeable. So much so that their repetition begins to erode their connection to reality. Anthropologist Marc Auger, whose book Non Places inspired Burton's game, speaks of this as a condition of super modernity. A solitude made all the more baffling by the fact it echoes millions of others. Never before have individual histories been so explicitly affected by collective history, but never before either have the reference points for collective identification been so unstable. We see this in Ireland's eerie, unpredictable environments. Even the apartment buildings that rise from the parking lot, which Parkin continues, speak to the jarring asynchronicity of modern life, the closeted way in which we live in cities, so close, so apart. 
Just as the term liminal has sprawled car park-like across academia, the space it describes has become increasingly extensive. With the rise of rented accommodation and co-working spaces, much of inner city life could be considered, in some way, liminal. But unlike La Chapelle's diorama, which Deborah Timish suggests invokes the human impulse to organise and standardise space, particularly communal space, Ireland's framework is one of playful subversion. Since these non-places are not places, they don't follow the rules of places, and so become spaces of possibility. Games journalist Joshua Wise considers these settings evocative of all those little moments lurking at the periphery of our memories, as if something half remembered is then half something else, half fantasy, half dream, half mystery, allowing curiosity to be reinserted into the mundane, an invitation to consider what we could be doing differently. Because all good things either come to an end or live long enough to become too much of a good thing and then come to an end. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the phrase. And car parks are as much an agent of entropy as they are accessibility. Made so all may visit the beautiful things, enjoy them, cherish them, and gradually destroy them. Like a worn out record or an overwatered cactus. But Bigelow Taxi seems to advocate for transience as the way things are. Despite name dropping the parking lot in the chorus, it names itself after the fleeting taxi of the final verse. It wryly comments on what's been lost, but doesn't try to cling on, making the car park not only unnatural in its imposition, but also its supposed permanence. Maybe mocking the idea that we can never stay as long as we like. Because that's another thing we tend to do. As well as not appreciating what we have, it can be hard to let go of what we once had, however inevitable it's passing. Desperate to hold on to our past as if it were the last parking space. Like the obsession with youth, which we can even see here in this parking scene from Fried Green Tomatoes. Uh, I was waiting for that space. Face it lady, we're younger and faster. <laughs> which is really a projection of middle-aged insecurity. The young don't think about being young. Young only really appears from the perspective of old, when something we had is gone. And as author Pamela Lou's satirically solemn comparison mocks, we awake to columns of numbered spaces, side walls of youthful freewheeling escape now consigned to their individual resting spots. Were we destined to stay parked like this forever? To commune indefinitely with a faceless, pitiless field? But a preoccupation with loss can mean we continue to lose sight of where we are now, what we might have gained, and what we could make of it. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Face it, girls. I'm older and I have more insurance. It's this presentness that Pamela Lou's fictional group of experimental musicians pursue in their recordings of ambient parking lot noise in the novel the Ambient Parking Lot when we championed authentic experience and plunged headlong into the romance of the overlooked space. Perhaps inspired by a similarly present-focused performance by the Flaming Lips in the late 90s, where 40 cassette tapes were played in unison on car stereos, of which, in true transient fashion, no documentation exists, so here's an artist rendition. As Lou writes of the fictional Parkers, these recordings were meant to be made, not heard. And now, even the car park's time has come. As photographer Agnesi Sanfito set out to document them before they disappeared, now under threat of demolition due to increasing land values. In fact, when I went on my research-based car park tour of London, because I'm a cool person who knows how to have a good time, I found that as I approached the most famous car park, lauded for its architecture by many a top 10 list, but I was already too late, despite the three-star rating still visible on Google Maps. Vast structures may seem immovable, unyielding, overwhelming, and eternal, like the endless sprawl of parking spaces or the endless covers of Big Yellow Taxi, a natural setting for helplessness. So unlike the freedom and autonomy of a speeding vehicle, the ecstatic velocities made possible by fossil fuel and combustion lose ambient parkers right. It was tempting to lose ourselves inside its ambient roar, blotting out everything aside from sound and speed and thrumming air. It's tempting to cling on to what we once had, and, if that fails, to give up. Give in to the deafening sounds of escapist propulsion, 
which, depending on where we are in the metaphor, falls somewhere on a spectrum between unsustainable and planet-destroying. But I think what makes the playfully jaunty rhythm of Big Yellow Taxi so astute is that, while it could easily set the rhythm for our mindless waltz off the edge of the Earth, it also resounds with resilience. To persist, to adapt, to live in the throes of what's been created, in the face of inevitable loss. So, while it does have, well, if it isn't the consequences of my own actions, energy, if you try to etch out a silver lining, and don't I always, it's maybe also saying, don't give up, you dingus. But putting my etching needle aside before a positive spin becomes its own kind of evasive maneuver, we can still acknowledge the pain of it, mourn our losses, regret the role we played in them, so that we may awake in the present as Pamela Lou finishes, wide-eyed and clear-headed, to the sounds of our unspectacular existence. Don't it always leave me go that you don't know what 